Hello, uh, my name is Professor Ken Swope, and I am the third instructor for History 101 for you guys online this semester. My specialty is the history of East Asia, particularly China, Japan, and Korea in the early modern era. And originally I was supposed to be one of the lead instructors uh, for this course. I managed to uh, receive a fellowship to go somewhere else for the fall. And, um, and I decided to continue to help out my colleagues and you, hopefully, by doing a few lectures on the Asian sections of the course, at least some of them, uh, for your, uh, hopefully, learning enjoyment. So today I'm going to be talking about the ancient Asian civilizations as they originated in India and in China, the Indus River Valley and the Yellow River Valley civilizations. So I'll be saying a few things about them as they pertain to the other river valley civilizations you've already learned about and also look at some specifics with each of these civilizations and talk about how the origins of these civilizations then were later reflected in what developed in them in terms of religion, culture, social structure, and these other things that will hopefully you'll learn more about as the semester goes on. So this is uh, ancient India and China, Asia's first civilizations. And one of the things that makes these two places in particular so relevant for a course like this is the fact that in both India and China, there is still today a lot of evidence of these ancient civilizations, of the uh, cultures that uh, they produced, and elements of the cultures of India and China that were created in these eras continue to exist today. And so there's, there's continuity that you don't always see in other parts of the world. And the residents, you know, natives of both India and China today are justly proud of their ancient heritage and traveling to China in particular, you'll often hear this, people talking about China's 5,000 year old history and their ancient culture and traditions and things like that. And uh, so today we're going to be learning a little bit about some of these ancient civilizations and where they come from. I'll be highlighting some things that tie into contemporary civilization. So we're going to start out with a brief chronology, just the overview of everything I'm going to be talking about today in a chronological sense. However, don't think you have to memorize all this. This is just to give you a sense of the span of time we're looking at. And especially early on in this class, we tend to cover centuries, millennia in one lecture. We'll be slowing down a little as we go on, but just to give you a basic sense. So we have the Harappan civilization, uh, circa 2500 to 1200 BC. And in some cases, you'll see BCE, which means Common Era. As a Catholic, I prefer the older BC. Uh, designations, so I will keep them throughout my lectures. You'll see BC and AD from me, but it's the same as BCE or A or uh, you know, CE. Uh, the Aryan invasions, which we'll be talking about today as well, you know, and these are rough dates. When we're talking about the ancient period, as you probably know, right, many of these dates are done through archaeology, not hard, concrete, written evidence. And so they're often quite fluid and uh, contested. So I'm just giving you general dates for a lot of these. The uh, Longshan or Xia cultures in China, the first two are the Indian civilizations that we'll be talking about today. Uh, the rest of these are from China. So the, Xia, the Shang dynasty, and there were, you'll sometimes see different dates for this as well. Sometimes they go up to 1045 BC. And uh, then the Zhou dynasty, and I should point out in your textbook it's rendered with the C-H-O-U, but it's pronounced Zhou like the English name Zhou. Uh, there are multiple systems of Romanizing Chinese. The current accepted version is called the Han Yu Pinyin system, uh, which features a lot of Z's and X's and Q's and things like that. And so that's the system I generally use and prefer, but your textbook uses the older Wei Giles system, which was developed in the 19th century by a pair of missionaries, surprisingly named Wei and Giles. And uh, so uh, throughout the class, I'll try to, when they differ, I'll try to give you the example so you know exactly what I'm talking about um, in terms of the, uh, the places. But we won't ask you to pronounce it. And then the Western Zhou, the Zhou is divided into Eastern and Western halves based on the location of the capital city. And um, today we'll talk a little bit about the Western Zhou. In the following lecture I do, we'll be looking at the Eastern Zhou into the Warring States period and all the great philosophers of China. So as you can see here, we're looking at roughly 2,500, um, oh, really over 2,000 years of history covered today in this lecture. So we're doing so in a very general fashion, hopefully give you a sense of these places and the societies and civilizations that emerged out of them. And so we're going to begin 
with a discussion of the Indus River Valley civilizations in uh, what is now India and Pakistan, and then we'll move to China after that. Um, before I move on, I want to say a couple of things to sort of tie it into what you've already been studying in the class. Obviously, you've looked at some of the Middle Eastern civilizations, Mesopotamia, Egypt, etc. And so again, in these parts of the world, as in the Middle East and in North Africa, which you've studied, civilizations emerged around rivers. And this makes a lot of sense when you think about it in terms of access to water for growing crops, for transportation, obviously for drinking, for cleaning, um, and also for access to animals who would come to the water to drink, fish and things living in the water. And so in both these cases, we're looking at civilizations that emerge around these river areas and then will extend outwards. Although the radius of control of the political states we're looking at was generally much smaller than what we might conceive of as a modern state or empire kingdom, something like that. And um, the other thing I'll draw your attention to is that the places in which these civilizations emerged are quite different today. You know, the climate is different, in both cases drier, less hospitable, and so there are, there are concrete reasons why these early centers of civilization in both India and in China shifted to other places later. Remember, we're talking about thousands of years ago. And so climate, there was climate change even in the Neolithic. Not perhaps at the rate that we know about today, but there were things going on. And in fact, one of the major arguments for the end of the Indus River Valley civilization has to do with sort of climatological and natural disaster, uh, disasters that happened in that civilization. So we'll talk about that a little bit today as well. So we start with the Indus Valley civilization. And so this map is from your textbook, so hopefully it's very uh, familiar to you. And you can see uh, some of the sites here in the, uh, with the black marks, those are the uh, excavated sites. The, the sort of blue color on there are the general course uh, locations of the Indus River, river civilization. You can see a dried up course of an old river here. You can see the Indus River flowing out of the Himalayas down into the Arabian Sea. And um, so one thing I'd say, this is the cradle, considered the cradle of Indian civilization. And if you know something about contemporary politics, you might also realize, you know, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, the modern countries all in this area. And as you may know, right, some of these areas are contested, contested political territory between India and Pakistan. And part of that has to do with the legacy of this civilization. Right? Who can claim ancient India, the ancient Indus civilization? Is it Pakistan's? Is it India's? And um, so if you think ancient history doesn't matter, in fact, it often does matter in the modern world. And uh, you, you might see the stories you know, virtually every day in the news, depending on what you're reading about this. Um, so you can see the Indus River flowing out of the uh, Himalayas, early city centers. The most uh, noticeable are the uh, cities of Harappa, located up there, and Mohenjo-Daro, over here. These are the largest two city sites that have been excavated in terms of you know, the extent of the cities and the population of the cities. See some of the other ones. Those are the main two we're going to be talking about today. So here's a shot of the Indus River at Mahanjadaro, and notice you know, from the site harappa.com. So these uh, things are available on the web, as you can see the Indus here. You can see that you can still used for heavy agriculture. So in terms of the Harappan civilization, I'm going to highlight a variety of different things. I'm going to talk about the civilization that pre preceded them first, and then get into the Harappans themselves. Uh, one of the issues we have with the ancient Indus civilizations, more so than with, uh, say, the Shang Dynasty, what we're talking about in China, is the fact that we don't have written records. There's no written records that people can actually read. And um, there are a number of reasons for this. There are scripts that emerge under the Harappans, but they haven't been deciphered. I'll talk about them later. And it's also possible, and perhaps highly plausible, that there was writing that was done on materials that have perished, palm leaves, things like this. And so it's really stone, uh, stone artifacts that we have the most records of in terms of actual some form of writing. But since nobody's been able to decipher this writing, and it's not clearly related to some of the later scripts, we really, a lot of what we have to go by is archaeology, supposition, and then texts that were written down later sort of extrapolating back. And in some cases we're talking about you know, over a thousand years later, two thousand years later. 
And so a lot of this is conjectural. But because of archaeological excavations, we've been able to find out quite a bit, at least about you know, trade networks, the orientation of these cities, what they looked like, and make some inferences about things like religion, social structure, politics, these sorts of things, um, which I'll be talking about today. But first, before I get into the Harappans, I want to say a few things about the pre-Harappan civilization, so predating 2500 BC, which again would put them on a par with some of the ancient Egyptian civilizations you've studied, Sumeria, some of these other places in the uh, Middle East. For one, the climate was much wetter, something I mentioned earlier, so agriculture could be sustained for large cities by, in prehistoric sense, I mean, we're not talking about massive modern cities. Um, in terms of the, the type of material culture, bronze weaponry, pottery, um, tools, mirrors, uh, weapons used obviously for defense and for offense, also uh, you know, tools and weapons used for hunting have been excavated in some of these pre-Harappan sites. Um, what's also quite interesting is in terms of the types of artifacts they've discovered that may have a religious significance. Lots of images of bulls, and as you may know, cattle remain sacred in India to this day, so there's evidence that from a very ancient time, cattle were religiously significant, if not sacred, in uh, Indian culture. Lots of images of fish, which makes sense, you know, river valley civilization, a lot of largesse coming from the water. Um, another interesting uh, Discovery concerns lots of images of females, women. And it seems that at least in part of Harappan civilization, women had a higher status than they perhaps later had in uh, India. And also, some scholars have suggested that some of these ancient civilizations were in fact matriarchal, and that women were high priestesses, and that descent was reckoned through female lines. Uh, that's interesting also in the sense that there are civilizations, you know, sub-societies in uh, modern India where that is still the case, that they're matriarchal in descent. So there is a possibility of some of that having emanated from these pre-Harappan civilizations. And uh, but again, with the lack of written records, we can't be sure. These are purely conjectural uh, speculations at this point. That is worth uh, noting. So what's also interesting in terms of the civilizations themselves, in both the case of Harappa and the Shang Dynasty, is how essentially these were ancient civilizations in which there was perhaps some memory of in the later societies of China and India, but in fact it was not until the relatively recent era that they were rediscovered, so to speak, by, um, by scholars, scientists, investigators, etc. In the case of Harappa, you know, rediscovered by British surveyors in the mid-19th century, in the 1800s. As you may know, India was colonized by Great Britain starting in the 1700s. And so in the 1800s, as the British were looking to unify the subcontinent, as they saw it by building railroads and connecting things, did a lot of excavations for their various projects of modernization. And in the process of this, they started discovering things you know, under the cities that they were working in. And Harappa was one of these um, discoveries. And essentially it came from finding pottery and things and finding scripts that nobody knew what they were, and doing a little more digging and a little more digging, and eventually realizing that what they had discovered was one of these ancient civilizations that you know, far predated anything they had discovered before. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, they have not been able to decipher the scripts of the uh, Harappan civilization. There are, there, they, some of them seem to be pictographic, others seem to be symbolic. In terms of uh, the numbers, it's interesting because the number of images they've discovered so far are about 400. And um, the problem with that number is that that's too many to be an alphabet. Most alphabets have 50 or less uh, characters. Now our alphabet with 26, um, the Korean alphabet 24, you know, so alphabets typically have a much smaller number of characters. But if you're talking about a written script, like a pictographic script or something like Chinese, it's usually far more than 400. I mean, Chinese, you know, it's, it's 40, 50,000 for the, the entirety of Chinese characters, 7,000 or so for literacy. And so just think about it even in your own sense. Could you just get by in life with only knowing 400 words? You know, probably not, maybe as an infant. As a young child, a few hundred words would get you by. But so that makes it very difficult. And since they're so unfamiliar to what other scripts were in India later, it's nobody can still really figure out what, what these, uh, what these uh, characters mean. So that's something I wanted to note. 
But what we were able, or what we, what scholars were able to do, was to uh, excavate some of these city sites and make extrapolations based on the layouts of the cities, based on other evidence, archaeological evidence, and, com and compile that in conjunction with a historical record to get a sense of what Harappa may have been like. And so one of the things they discovered in the process of this was that the city, in fact, and the culture was apparently relatively wealthy because the, uh, the major cities, I mentioned Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa in particular, were pretty large for the time, populations of perhaps 40,000 or even more. And so you may not think of Hattiesburg as a particularly large city, but in the ancient world, 40,000 is a lot of people. That suggests significant resources. They were planned cities. They were laid out on grids. They had wide avenues. They had a number of um, other sort of public spaces, public settings and facilities. Um, the major cities in particular were built more fortress-like, so that suggests a some level of political control, possible rivals, and you know, and the later the later architecture certainly suggests uh, some evidence of foreign invasion, um, and also the ability of the state to control and protect its people, as you know from studying ancient civilizations. One of the major goals or rationales for the existence of civilization itself or for cities is defense. Right? You want to allocate resources and protect the people. And certainly they were doing that in these cities in Harappa and Mahanjadara. Uh, again, the people had uh, you know, bronze and bronze tools. They had pottery. They had mirrors. They had uh, you know, various other uh, weapons and things. You had, um, additionally, what's, what's particularly striking about these cities is the level of apparently public service that existed. The, the, some of the cities appear to have had sewage systems, and, and think about that. I mean, this is remarkable in the sense that we're talking about 2000 BC, sewage systems for the entire city. And um, this is highly advanced. I mean, frankly, you know, much of modern India doesn't have sewage systems in its cities. Um, toilets, and there's some evidence that, you know, a lot of houses, maybe every house had some form of toilet. Uh, public bathing facilities, bathing platforms, um, and also water storage facilities. Uh, initially, what they thought were large public baths might also have actually been water storage facilities, and then there were bathhouses nearby where people you would know, take, take baths privately and things like that. Um, and intensive agriculture based on you know, peas, rice, wheat, those kind of grain crops, uh, you know, things like um, extensive rice agriculture seems to have emerged later, but uh, like peas, wheat, rye, these things were, were very uh, common. Also, raising of animals, you know, for animal husbandry, and, and particularly uh, also fish. And so, although it's not, it's not clear that, that they actually ate beef, but certainly uh, other animals, land and things. So, very sophisticated civilizations, defense networks, clearly organizing grids, and also widespread trade networks were one of the other things, which I haven't really talked about yet. But uh, trade networks, because what we found is that the uh, Indian civilizations apparently traded with their counterparts in the Middle East, and uh, shells and things seem to have come from the Mediterranean. In exchange, they sent gemstones, among others, and in fact, South Asia today is still well known for its gem production. So lapis lazuli, carnelians, you know, garnets, these sorts of things would be sent from Harappa into these other areas along, along various trade routes. And uh, so extensive trade networks with the areas in the Middle East and to the, I guess it would be in their case, to the uh, West. Um, in terms of religion, again, you know, uh, some of this is speculative and it's based on later texts, including the Vedas, which you guys will be learning about later in the semester when you're uh, studying uh, Indian religion but probably a powerful priestly class, and this remains true for much of Indian society. And so priests at the top, and again, this is not that unusual, right? Most of the societies you've studied in this ancient period are theocracies, right? They have connection, they, the upper classes have connection to the gods, they reinforce their power through their connection, through rituals, through ceremonies, through temples, through um, you know, ritual, ritual architecture, all of these things seem to have been uh, characteristic of the Harappan religion. Um, warrior deities, some of whom appear to have emerged, 
been preserved by the Aryans who come in later, or maybe even introduced by the Aryans in the late Harappan period, which I'll um, talk about a little bit later. But and the other thing which is interesting is the the number of images that depict women and also fertility, sexual activity, phallic in nature. And I bring this up in the sense that later Hinduism, unlike perhaps many of the Judeo-Christian, the Judeo-Christian tradition or some of the other Middle Eastern traditions, very much emphasized the beauty and joy of procreation, of doing that as a way of honoring the gods. And it seems that some of these beliefs that were preserved in Hinduism later, which you know, emerges in the centuries after the fall of Harappa, has its antecedents in this ancient faith. Another thing you see with some of the images are figures that are clearly in what we would describe as yoga poses, contorted, meditating, and again, these are connected to spirituality, they're connected to the, the means to understand the universe, and certainly you see that in the later uh, Indian religions as well. So the speculation suggests that a lot of the antecedents for what eventually become Hindu practices were in fact present under Harappa, and so I wanted to point that out for you. Um, so it's a little bit about religion. In terms of you know, what eventually happens to the Harappans and in terms of its decline is that um, you know, they flourished for hundreds of years, thousands, over a thousand years in fact, and the decline is still heavily contested by scholars. The traditional view which was preserved in later texts, suggests a series of invasions by people that uh, scholars originally called the Aryans. And um, now you know, terminology has shifted somewhat uh, because of the, uh, in part because of the negative connotations associated with the term Aryan, which many of you may have heard in reference to the Nazis in World War II and the superior race. In fact, the term is originally linguistic and it refers to peoples from what, are, what is now sort of Central Asia, kind of northwest of India. And in fact, I should point out, which I haven't mentioned, that some of the uh, language groups that eventually permeate India, and go to the Middle East, the Indo-Aryan language groups, they are in fact the, the predecessors of you know, modern languages. They are related to Greek, to Latin, to English. And so you will find words actually in Hindi that are very similar to words that we use in English. And so there is a common linguistic origin for these peoples, um, at least for this part of uh, northern India. Actually, southern India, they have a different linguistic tradition. But uh, so the Harappan decline is um, contested. The original argument was the Aryans came in, invaded, and conquered. Another, um, another suggestion, which is also seems quite plausible, is gradual drought desertification. You know, basically, agriculture became less and less productive. The rulers were less and less able to kind of command the resources they needed to maintain roads and trade networks, to maintain the, you know, a standard of living that would support their uh, population. Another argument which is related to that is changes in the level of the Arabian Sea and um, you know, advancing seawaters or retracting seawaters, depending on where they were at. Um, earthquakes. Is another explanation given earthquakes that devastated a couple of cities, you know, and, and ruined their capacity to respond. And again, think about this in modern terms. Some of you, uh, you know, it's been a while now, but remember Katrina a few years back and how difficult it was for the modern United States to respond to a natural disaster. Now think about this 2,000 years ago in a realm without electricity, in a realm without instant communications. You know, how would you answer to How would you respond to sort of a series of natural disasters? And the, you know, this may have been what was happening to the Harappans. Um, and, and then, or it, or it could be, and I think it's probably more likely to have been a combination of things. You know, foreign invasion, uh, desertification, you know, drought, you know, famine, these things together. And what seems to definitely have happened is that over time, the ability of a state to mobilize resources and to continue to you know, kind of keep things together declined. The quality of the later buildings, as in terms of the dating, declined. The uh, the you know, the overall you know, quality of the pottery and things seems to have declined, which suggests that the state was less wealthy, less able to continue to manage its resources in in the later era of its uh, of its existence. To all some of the some of the issues, and it suggests a deterioration of the uh, ruler's power. 
going to show you a couple of images here, and then I will actually talk about the, the briefly talk about the Aryan society and their contributions to ancient India. And here's one of our things. So you can see a chariot. This is from your textbook. Hopefully, it's coming out in your your video there. But, I, but definitely pay attention to this. It looks like there's one, maybe two horses here. I can't tell. Um, you've got you've got your little rider there. Obviously, the number was put on by an archaeologist. They didn't number their stuff. Um, it's a skew number for selling in the Harappan markets. But uh, pay attention to this because you're going to see an image of a Shang chariot later, and we're going to talk about sh you know, the Shang Dynasty military. If I remember, chariots were a way for the elites to sort of set themselves apart from the other levels of society, whether militarily or otherwise. People that could ride and afford chariots and horses were clearly you know, elevated members of society. So that is an image of, a, of probably some sort of warrior, elite, ruler. You can see a little bit of uh, clothing here. You can see the, the face structure around there as well. So yeah, then perhaps a sense of what the ancient Indians looked like. And I've got a couple of images of some of the excavated cities here. So again, from Harappa.com. So in, I don't know if it's in this one, but in some of these you actually see people, so you'll get a sense of how you know, big these buildings are. But notice the structure, sort of the, the streets, the walls, and think about some of the other places you've looked at, ancient Samaria and some of these other cities, and how the structure is kind of the same. And cities and fortresses, often the same thing. And uh, something to keep in mind is ancient societies. Oh, yeah, here's one with some people. So you get a little bit of sense of scale and keeping in mind that you know, these don't have roofs or anything on them now, so they're a little bit of talk. Get a sense of that. Think of a bathing platform coming up next, right? Yeah, so some people argue that this is, in fact, an outside bathing platform where big vats of water would be held and then you would pour water over yourself to clean yourself. Other scholars say no, they would bathe inside separately and that this would just be a water storage tank. So uh, you know, I, I present you both, both arguments. I don't really have a, uh, have a dog in the fight. But, um, but clearly what is interesting is the ability to mobilize the resources, to have the drainage, to have this. And that's one of the reasons why the Harappan rulers right, were the rulers, right? The, the ability to command and organize labor to do these things and then provide for their subjects. And when they're no longer able to do that, well, the subjects get another ruler. And uh, that becomes the Aryans. And we know a bit more about them because of you know, later historical records. Who are the Aryans? As I mentioned before, the Aryans are the, um, now, the term is linguistic, it is not racial. They originally come from Central Asia, sweeping in from what would be Northwest. Um, and, uh, although it is worth noting that it's possible that the, the Aryan people were of a lighter skin tone than the people that they conquered, and that that later played a role in the creation of social groups or castes in India. And the idea of the higher caste being the more pure, uh, and, and so there may be some connection there, but it's not, it's not firm. And certainly the term is not initially designed to be a racial term, it is, it is much more a location and a linguistic term. But they invaded India in the Middle East from the area of the Caspian and Black Seas. And what they really did in terms of changing culture is that they, to a much greater degree, horses, chariots, and a very militaristic culture. Their religion was, you know, clearly very militaristic, probably more so than the Harappans. And the stories that were preserved later of the Aryans depict them as rowdy. They liked gambling. They liked warfare. They liked fire. They liked all these things that made them, you know, a much more aggressive martial power. Of course, you know, written down by the people who were the Aryans' descendants, making them look good, making them look more masculine, as opposed to the effete, corrupt, decadent Harappans. And so throughout history, we'll see this. You always got to remember when you're reading these texts or hearing about them, who's producing them and why, right? And just kind of keep that in mind as you're reading this. But, um, you know, and so the, uh, eventually the Aryans move in. They bring in, as I said, a military culture and new ideas about religion. Uh, Indra, the god of lightning, god of war, comes in. Agni, the god of fire, enters the pantheon. And these deities will remain in later Hinduism. And they're preserved in texts known as the Vedas. And the Vedas are significant 
in the sense of, you know, some of them are poems, some of them are stories about the gods and, and how the world came to be. They're also significant in the sense that they are the oldest texts in the world still used in worship. And so they are still used in Hinduism, you know, various forms of the Vedas. And there are lots of Vedas, the Rig Veda, etc. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about them today. But um, that's, a, that's a sort of noteworthy thing, although they were written much later. So while the Aryans may have come in around 1200 BC, it's hundreds of years later when they're written down. Some of the Vedas are not even written down until you know, the common era, right, after Christ. And so just keep that in mind that they're, we're extrapolating back. But what's significant about them is that a, a lot of the religious beliefs and ideals espoused in the Vedas were then later adopted into the Indian pantheon in general. So many of the deities were adopted into the Indian pantheon in general. And then also they, will, they bring in the idea of, um, of uh, castes and different ranks of society. And so in terms of you know, how it kind of connects to the, the broader picture. I mean, one of the things they do is you know, the culture in general of the Aryans seem to have been much more martially inclined, not as uh, trade-oriented as that of the uh, Harappans. They seem to have been at least initially semi-nomadic, and that again also connects with their kind of warrior background, so a little bit different. Um, but their society was also divided into different classes. Warriors, priests, and commoners, the, the biggest classes, those will eventually morph into the castes, which I'll talk about here in a second. And so, so you had a class-oriented system, and you had a, a system that valued military culture, but also, again, religion and religious authorities, as we'll, as we'll see. And so in terms of why they did this, I mean, some of the explanation is, of course, is they come in as a conquering people. You try to find a way to justify where you are in the hierarchy. Why you've conquered these other people? Well, you've come up with a convenient system to uh, denote why this is. And as you might suspect from what you've studied so far in class, right? Who writes this down? Well, the small group of literate people who are generally the priests. And so, unsurprisingly, when they eventually articulate this system, they put themselves at the top of the social order. But what's interesting in later in Indian culture is how they come up with very specific and elaborate justifications for the caste system. And the idea is that the caste system is needed to make society function. And that it's a manifestation of one's cleanliness. And then it will be later that they come up with the idea of karma, merit, rebirth and how everything is tied to what you've done in previous lives, and so therefore you are at a specific position in the social hierarchy based on what you did in an earlier incarnation. That's, uh, it, the, so the concept of reincarnation comes in there and gets tied into the caste system. It does, it's not clear that that originated, originally was the idea, but certainly it gets, it gets brought into later. But, but keep in mind, there's a very ingenious system of social control and organization. And um, it will also help a large society sort of differentiate itself and kind of function. Because right? everybody is born into a caste, and then they, therefore, they know where they belong in society, what their job is, who they should interact with, who they should uh, deal with. And the caste system will allow for that. And so now there are other systems throughout the world that do this. It's probably India that becomes the most specific in this. And some people argue the reason they have to do this is because there are so many people. You know, throughout history, we haven't talked much about population, but throughout history, right, India and China are the world's most populous places, you know, the, the states that emerge in India and China. And so they come up with rather different approaches to how to deal with that population, though, and create this idea of social order. In India, they hit upon the idea of caste, right? You, you, you have a position in society, and you must fulfill your role. And if you're born at the bottom of the caste system, and we'll identify this in a second, then, you know, therefore, your job is to do the best job wherever you are. If you're at the bottom, you know, it's, it's a result of what you did in previous lives. So just do better, maybe you'll be higher next time. In China, on the other hand, they come up with the idea of meritocracy, and the idea that you can study and earn your way up, and you can work your way up in society. But and eventually, everybody's going to the same goal, to kind of create this hierarchy. But in both cases, it's a hierarchical system. And so it's one thing to keep in mind when you're studying, especially in these ancient societies, they're not about everybody's born equal. We all have a chance to get ahead in the world. It's in fact you know, often the opposite of that. 
and uh, just sort of, you know, so try not to judge them by our values, by the way we've been raised, and so as we're, as we're studying this stuff. Um, so briefly, to talk about the caste, right? At the top, you have the Brahmins. These are the priests. They are the intermediaries. And these castes were supposed to be designed by cleanliness, by how close you were to the gods. The gods were perfect, clean, spiritual beings, and the castes were supposed to reflect that. So you have the priests, the literate elites at the top. Number two, you have the warriors, the fighters. And this would make sense, right, because the Aryans themselves were warriors, so you elevate that. I mean, if I'm thinking about it, I would think being a warrior would be kind of a dirty job. Are you killing people? You're covered in blood. Wouldn't this be dirtier than being a merchant, for example, somebody who's just selling things? But then again, right, the warriors have the weapons, so they can therefore put themselves at the number two position in the hierarchy behind the Brahmins. Uh, number three, the merchants. And these are the people who obviously buy and sell things and kind of keep commerce and society flowing. Uh, number four are the farmers and general laborers. And so people that they work with the earth are dirtier. Therefore, they are less clean and um, you know, physically by what they do. And I, I point this out. This is interesting because in the Chinese and Japanese uh, conceptualization, the Korean conceptualization, farmers are actually the number two in the social strata because they produce food. Whereas merchants are at the bottom because they don't produce anything, right? All they do is live off the rest of us. And um, so it's interesting how the different societies create their hierarchies based on specific values. And at the very bottom of this, of course, are the outcasts, sometimes called the untouchables. And these are people who do the most unclean jobs, handling dead bodies, digging graves, you know, working in sewers, that sort of thing. And uh, later, when you get into the Hindu traditions, there were, there were often very strict uh, rules governing relations between the castes. Um, lower caste people were supposed to not interact with the upper caste except in certain situations. In some cases, they weren't even supposed to you know, see them. The upper caste, if, if you were of low caste, you were supposed to announce you were coming through town. You clap your hands or something and say, you know, you know, low class person, low caste person coming through so everybody could leave so they wouldn't be sullied. You know become dirty by, by your very presence. And to some degree, the caste system has persisted into modern India. In many cases, you know, arranged marriages still exist, and often you're not supposed to marry anybody who's of a lower caste than yourself. Um, the British did their best to do away with it, but it never quite took. And, um, and so there are still issues today as far as the caste system is, is concerned in terms of you know, everyday relations, universities, and things like that. But um, but that's, a, that's a, a topic for History 102. I just want to give you the origins of the system here, which seems to have come in with the Aryans. So, let's see. Jump ahead here. Okay. So, um, so in terms of, uh, so we're going to move uh, on to ancient China. We're about halfway through the lecture here. A little more than halfway. So we're going to move on to ancient China, and um, I'm going to come back to India at the end of the lecture here and, and you know, sort of tie things together. So, um, ancient China, we've got uh, you know, a couple of uh, basic things I'm going to talk about here, but again, like I mentioned with India, it is you know, a civilization that goes back a long ways, they're very proud of it, and you see evidence of it all over. When you go to China, you will see evidence of these, even these ancient cultures. In fact, I, I was just in China a few weeks ago, and I was at several museums that highlighted this ancient period of Chinese history, because I happen to be in the part of the country where the uh, Shan civilization uh, existed. One of the more interesting concepts, excuse me, is the notion of the independent origins of humanity. As you've probably learned in this class, right, the generally accepted version is that humans originated, evolved in Africa, and then spread to other parts of the world. Well, uh, a few decades ago in China, there were scholars that argued, in fact, there were several independent places where humans evolved. And China was one of them. And uh, so, um, you know, and they, they, they find various forms of archaeological evidence for this. You know, they, they cite the, the rise of uh, Peking or Beijing man around 400,000 BC as an early proto human. And in fact, as I mentioned, just this summer I was in China at a museum where they said, where they showed some artifacts and pictures of people that were, you know, certainly in the stage between ape and man, and they showed the tools and things. And they said, well, by showing you this, we've definitively proved that humans evolved independently in China. Um, I'm not sure they did that. 
but it's interesting to point out as a real source of cultural pride and um, a sense of their own you know, sort of uniqueness as a civilization. And they said, yeah, sure, humans evolved in Africa. Sure, but they also evolved in China. And we didn't come from Africans. And it's a very interesting kind of bit, again, with ancient history, it becomes culturally very important. And to see this, this wasn't just on a website, right? This isn't a major museum in Sichuan province. Where they have these remains and things. And um, so, so you have this sort of discussion of the ancient uh, world. You have the emergence of civilizations in the Yellow River Valley, which we're going to talk about today, particularly the uh, Shan Dynasty. And then when you get into written records, in China, much like in other civilizations, you have the uh, discussion of ancient culture heroes and sage kings, people that embody the traditions of China. So people that teach them how to um, raise silkworms to spin silk, people that give them the secret of fire, people that teach them how to be loyal to their parents, all these other sort of kind of culture figures. And, and it's interesting how many of them have colors associated with them. You have the yellow emperor, and you know, yellow becomes the imperial color. In one of the folk legends of ancient China, the, the Chinese people are created from the soil, the yellow soil around the Yellow River, by a woman called Nu Hua, which is suspiciously close to the Indian term Naga, which refers to a serpent. But Nu Hua is a snake woman. She's got arms. And she creates the Chinese people out of the yellow soil. And that's why Chinese people have that skin tone. This is according to the traditional legend. Uh, you know, there are other legends of a you know, famous archer who shoots, there were ten suns in the sky and he shoots nine of them down to allow humanity to survive, so there's only one sun left. And so in the, in the later traditions you have these legends of cultural heroes and sage kings who then give the Chinese the various elements of civilization. And uh, you know, since this is a general course, we're not going to go into great detail on those. If you're interested, take one of my Chinese history classes someday. But, uh, but a lot of interesting things that emerge out of there. Um, let's see what else I wanted to focus on here. And what you will see is, um, again, like in other societies, the ancient Chinese civilizations identified by location and by pottery type. And a lot of these places um, were you know, officially, I guess, discovered in the last century and a half. And there have been a lot of excavations. So now, initially, there was not a lot of interest in this. As China modernized and developed, these have become more and more important to the Chinese people and to the Chinese government. So that now when you go to China, you can go to many of these sites where they've excavated these ancient cities and they've recreated villages. You can walk around and see artifacts and things like that. And they've really seized upon it as an important part of the uh, cultural heritage. And again, to kind of reify China's position. I think what's interesting about this in a contemporary sense is that you see the Chinese government sort of embracing its status as a world power by highlighting its ancient traditions in, in a point of great pride. And so that's uh, something you, you, you see very interestingly. And, uh, and those of you who may remember, it's been a few years now, but the Beijing Olympics a few years ago tried to incorporate elements from ancient China into their, uh, into their Olympic Games as well. And so that, is, uh, that in and of itself is also an interesting thing. So, and, uh, and they're often identified by the type of pottery they had. It's, the Yangshao culture pottery here, which is you know, quite interesting. In fact, some people see similarities to Native American pottery, other things. And so these, the, the, the city, these are normally the cities. They talk about Longshan and Yangshao and stuff. That's the, that's the cities. We don't know really what these um, cultures call themselves, and so it's impossible to know. Um, and, and we don't know necessarily what language they spoke, probably some version of what became modern Chinese. We know that the Shang Dynasty appears to have a language that evolved into modern Chinese. And um, I should point out that there's actually another, traditionally there's another Chinese dynasty. The first one is called the Xia, which may have been mentioned in your textbook, at HSIA or XIA. But that one has not been historically authenticated yet by archaeology. We only know that from much later written records. So the dynasty we're really going to be talking about today that we know existed is the Shang Dynasty. And, um, not that you have to learn Chinese, but notice the pronunciation. There are no hard A's, no hard vowel sounds in Chinese. So there are no Shang. There's no Shang, there's no Tang, there's no Wang. It's a, it's a, it's a soft A sound. So we're talking about the Shang dynasty today. S-H-A-N-G. Which might look like Shang to you. And so, this is the uh, first historically authenticated dynasty in China. And... Um, it's known primarily through, uh, well, it was known through historical records for 
thousands of years, for over a thousand years prior to its actual authentication. And this is one of the things that's, again, like the discovery of Harappa, it's a fascinating story for sort of how uh, scholars discovered the Shang dynasty. And it's known through its oracle bones and shells, which we'll be talking about today. Um, and you've got pictures of them in your textbook, you're going to see a picture of them in a minute. And um, essentially what happened is around the turn of the last century, around 1900, there was an epidemic in North China, and a lot of people were dying of disease. And so in the marketplaces in the major cities, of course, people were eager to find some cure to the disease. So uh, at some point, people started selling what they called dragon bones to the masses. And they said, if you grind up these dragon bones in powder and then mix them with water and drink the soup, you will be cured or you know, effect effectively immunized against the, uh, the epidemic that was plaguing the North China Plain. Well, as it turns out, at least according to the popular story, a scholar of ancient China happened to be in the marketplace where they were selling these dragon bones. And he said, well, what are these? And so he looked at them and he realized that these were very ancient bones and turtle shells and that they had writing on them. And it was writing that was similar to Chinese but a little bit different, but he, he quickly deduced that it was very, very old and an earlier form of Chinese writing. So immediately he had to try to find out, you know, where, where this came from. And so after, after some investigation, he eventually determined that these bones were being purchased in uh, a, a city uh, near, in northern Henan province, which is the province south of where Beijing is located, called Anya. And as he started looking around more, he realized that, in fact, there were lots and lots of these things, but the peasants often thought that the bones weren't any good with the writing on them, so they were scraping all the writing off so they could properly sell the bones. And finally, he convinced them that these were incredibly valuable, very important for Chinese culture and society, and, um, and then and started buying them up. This led to a spate of people forging bones and writing fake writing on them to sell to make money. Um, eventually, uh, they were able to determine where these things were coming from and start <laughs> excavations. Although because of the, the war that was late Manchu dynasty, because of various political and other problems, it was about 30 years before systematic excavation started, but eventually what emerged was the discovery of major ancient sites and cities and literally tens of thousands of these so-called oracle bones and shells. And uh, because of that, we have a very good knowledge of the Shang dynasty, at least of its kings and high politics and some of its beliefs as, uh, as recorded on these oracle bones and shells. And um, they do a number of things for scholars. They uh, verify the existence of a dynasty that to that point had only been verified by later records. They verify the existence of the Chinese writing system, too, and, and give us some sense of how it evolved and where it came from, and give us some sense of social structure, spiritual beliefs. And so they were really one of the most important discoveries you know, in Chinese history in the last century and a half. And so tremendously important. And unlike the caves, because they were close enough to later Chinese, scholars have been able to decipher a good number of them. They can't read all of them. They've discovered so far about 3,000 different Chinese characters, you know, words, and they've deciphered probably a little over half of them that they can actually read and translate. So we do have a much better sense of the Shang dynasty than we do, say, of Harappa. And, um, and a pretty interesting picture of it, the Shang emerges because you get some sense of what they value, and you also get a sense of how uh, significant they were in the terms of creation of what we know as Chinese culture. Because many of the cultural values and practices and things were certainly transmitted to the later dynasties, to the Zhou and the Qin, etc., that we'll be talking about over the next few lectures. And so, um, you know, pretty fascinating stuff. Another thing which sort of connects the Shan to the other places you've been looking at is the fact that that these were oracles, right? that again, the priestly class was very powerful. In, the, in most of the texts, or a lot of the texts, are religious in nature, or deal with rulership in some way. And so like in ancient Greece, where people would go to an oracle for answers to their questions, the kings would come to these priests in, uh, in the Shan civilization and ask questions of them. And sometimes the questions would be very basic, very simple, like, you know, is ancestor so-and-so angry with me because I have a toothache? When will the toothache go away? 
And um, the way the oracle bone worked is that they would, take a, they would take a bone from a cow or something, usually a shoulder bone or a turtle shell, sometimes a thigh bone, and they would drill holes in the bone, and then they would, they would, they would take a poker and get it hot, and then, and then put it on the bone, and then where the cracks were, they'd interpret what the answer was, whether it was favorable or unfavorable, and then they'd write down the question and the answer later. So it seems like they asked the question, and the priest kind of knew how to, how to manipulate things, but they would ask questions and then uh, get the answers. And then what's great about it is in some cases, the bones have three or four sets of questions. So the king would say, is this a good day to go on a raid to the neighboring kingdom of such and such? And they would read the bones and say, nope, it's not a good day. So then they would wait. And then the next day, ask the question, is, it, is today a good day? Or will it rain? And in some cases, much like you know, predictors everywhere, if you've ever had your fortune told or something, the answers were very vague, designed to cover any eventuality. Yes, it will rain sometime in the next six weeks. And the king would say, this is fantastic. See, I have brought you rain. And... Um, <laughs> So you can see where sometimes there's certainly some manipulation going on with the oracle bones. But you also get information about you know, military campaigns, about the types of people that the Shang were fighting and interacting with, because the names of the different other peoples and states around the Shang are present on these oracle bones. And, um, and then physical things, or personal things. For example, we know from the oracle bones that women, at least at some point, were warriors, that they led military expeditions because there were references to warrior queens within the, uh, within the oracle bones themselves and, and to military campaigns. And they give, in some cases, they give numbers so we have some sense of how big the Shang armies were, which in you know, large cases over, over three, four, five thousand 5,000 troops. Um, and the biggest, maybe over 10,000. And uh, so you get some, some insights and also into culture itself. One of the most famous oracle bones, is the king is worried about one of his wives, his concubines. Will, she, will the birth be good or not? She's pregnant. And so they have a series of questions about the baby. And then the bones say, well, if it's born on such and such a day, it will be a good birth. If it's born on this day, it will be a bad birth. And so they record this over you know, three or four questions. And then in the end, they say, it was a bad birth. The baby was a girl. So you have some sense, even then, of the Chinese emphasis upon the male offspring, because they are the ones that progen the, you know, the, family is, the family line is reckoned through the male, rather than the female. And the female is seen as someone who leaves the household, who is a resource that is just you know, sort of thrown away. And so even in this ancient period, you have this kind of patriarchal sense of superiority, and that comes out in the, um, in the oracle bone and shell inscriptions. Um, likewise, because of them, we know a lot about ritual and spiritual life. The Shang seem to have spent a lot of time, perhaps an inordinate amount of time, in rituals and ceremonies. Um, the, the Ding, which you'll see, it's a ritual vessel. The Shang were experts at casting uh, bronzes. And so we have a lot of examples of the, um, of the uh, bronzes and things that they cast for, for food, for to commemorate military campaigns. For alcohol, it, it, it's interesting. The Shang seem to have spent a lot of time communing with the gods, with the spirits. And the Shang pantheon, some of the deities may have been preserved in later Chinese history. Their supreme god was just known as Shangdi, the Lord God on high, the progenitor of the Shang people. Um, interestingly enough, later missionaries, European Christian missionaries, tried to make the equivalence of Shangdi with the, the Christian god and say, oh, see, the Chinese long ago believed in one true God. Uh, that was not the case. I mean, the, the Shang deity is the ancestral deity of the Shang royal family. But, um, but it is an interesting sort of perspective that the later Christians came about. But what you do see is, is um, you know, a lot of ritual and ceremony. And perhaps it's not surprising, right? These guys drink more and more, and they start to see the gods. They become imbued with spiritual energy and life. And some people argue that that's what eventually happens to the Shang, is that the royal family and the elites became so infatuated with these endless ceremonies and things that they sort of lost their edge. They lost control of the far-flung vassals. Although more recent scholarship suggests that the Shang was never that powerful. Remember, we're talking about the primitive states. Despite its name, they only controlled maybe 250 square miles of territory. They, were never in, they weren't a state along the lines of the later empires the Han and the Chin that we'll be learning about later. 
but they did certainly practice ancestor worship, which is still practiced in China today. You know, many Chinese homes, almost any you know, ordinary Chinese people, you will often find candles and pictures of deceased relatives, incense being burned and stuff like that. And that practice of ancestor worship goes all the way back to the Shang Dynasty. Um, the food they ate, the differentiation of food, they didn't have stir fry like we think of Chinese, but they separated grains and rice from the, from the meat and vegetable dishes, and they would make meat and vegetables together in a pot and sort of stir it up. It was more like a stew than what we would consider stir fry, but, uh, but certainly that practice. The Shang Dynasty, they were still eating with their hands. It's not until about 200 BC that the Chinese started using chopsticks, but clearly some of the elements of cuisine that become Chinese cuisine were already present in the Shan period, which is interesting in and of itself. In terms of technological developments, Shang were known for the development of chariots, of military technology, and mostly bronze weapons, um, and pole arms in particular seem to have been the mainstay of the Shang armies. Uh, crossbows and, and bows and things emerge you know, in the Zhou period afterwards. But uh, chariots, bronze, military technology, and also bronze casting. The Shang were amazing casters of bronze, which was copper, tin, and lead mixed. And so, you know, thousands and thousands of bronze vessels from the Shang period have survived. And these include bells, they include, you know, drums and gongs, instruments, drinking uh, vessels, eating vessels, you know, cups, all kinds of ritual uh, things. And, and the Shang tombs were very impressive too, and so many Shang tombs have been excavated. You can find huge amounts of these uh, materials within the tombs. So, a couple of uh, images here. Zipping right along. How much time do we have now? Um, so, uh, in terms of geography, there we have the, the, the geographic area of the Shang. This is modern China. I don't know how clear that green is. but. Uh, but you've got uh, the Shan within that. You can see Korea over there in Japan, much smaller, and the sort of the sort of height of the, the sort of early Shan is probably up in up in kind of this area here, the other area. Um, but in terms of its uh, its physical state, there's some evidence that the Shan kings were sort of semi-nomadic, and that there was not one fixed capital, but they went from place to place to kind of govern the empire and exact tribute. And this in and of itself is again simple symbolic of later Chinese practice where the emperors would get tribute from the states considered beneath the uh, Chinese emperor. So we'll get into the society in a second. Uh, here is a somewhat fuzzy picture of an oracle bone and so you can see the holes in there, the cracks, and you can see a little bit of the writing. I'm going to talk about Chinese writing in a second. But uh, we've got that there. So you can see the little image there and how they would be interpreted. Of course, you'd have to be an expert to interpret the cracks, right? That's what made the priests so powerful. You know, the ordinary person, you or I, couldn't just burn a hole in a turtle shell and say, yeah, you know, it's good. we're going to have good harvest next month. And, and, you know, you had to have the specialized knowledge of connection with the gods to interpret that. But um, Chang society, we've talked about it a little bit already, you know, very religiously oriented, very hierarchical. We don't know much about society below the level of these, but we do know there was some sort of class system, um, in part because of burials. And we know uh, because a lot of uh, tombs have been excavated. And so clearly different levels within Shang society were reflected in burial practices. And you, you've learned about ancient India already. And so the Shang in some ways is like that in the sense of, you know, like the Egyptians, they believed you could take it with you, and you should take it with you. So when Shang rulers were buried, they were buried with their loyal retainers and with you know, concubines and with servants and with animals and things like this. And so it makes you think, maybe you didn't want to be a loyal servant of the king <laughs> because if the king dies, you're going with him. Um, and, and the way that they, and they would be buried with their stuff, they would be buried with um, ritual items, with clothing, with uh, jewels, with weapons. One of the uh, Shang female, uh, one of the Shang queens was buried in an entire suit of jade. Um, you know, hundreds of jade plates, I've actually seen it, it's amazing. That's just you know, it's ancient jade. Um, and likewise, your status was reflected in how you were buried. Uh, commoners were buried face down. Nobles buried face up. Horses would be buried alive, and I'll show you an image of it, you know, would be buried in there. Prisoners of war and captives 
would be buried alongside too, but they'd often have their arms and legs or even their heads cut off to show their inferior status. But the idea was that in the afterlife, they, they took all this with them. And what's interesting is that in the Shan, and these tombs were huge. I mean, they were probably a size, well, you can't see this room. But they were probably the size of this room in some cases that I'm lecturing in right now. And, um, you know, they would be very elaborate, 30, 40 feet underground with a variety of artifacts in multiple rooms. And what's interesting is that at this time, they probably buried people alive or killed them and then pushed them right in. And over time in China, the practice changes so that instead of putting actual people and servants into the tombs, they would put statues of people and servants into the tombs. And it's interesting because that will change too. Originally, right, the first emperor of the Qin Dynasty, or there about soon, right, he has a whole army of 10,000 soldiers, life size, at his tomb. Later, people will say, yeah, let's just put some small ones in. Let's, let's kind of cut back on this. And so you see this evolution. But there is, throughout history, especially the nobles, will bury food, sometimes real food, chopsticks, all these other things with them. And in fact, there was this idea of offering food to the ancestors, which is still practiced today in China. Oftentimes, people will leave food out for their deceased ancestors. They have to eat first before the family can eat. And that stems from the Shan. Um, so politically, a the theocracy, many neighboring states that they fought with, uh, you know, military, an expansive military power from what we know, and, and, and constantly at war with the states around it. And uh, you know, social structure, we know that the priests and the warriors were at the top, and the various other social classes below them, but we don't know as much about how those social classes were organized. Probably in terms of expertise, you know, martial skills, and then you know, farmers and merchants you know, towards the bottom. Later, we have a much better sense of the Zhou Dynasty of how the social structure worked. But the Shan, definitely a, a more theocratic society. And so, we have a little sense of that. The Shan, in terms of modern scholars, and perhaps most important for its uh, dis the discussion of the writing system. Of just a second. Um, this is a picture of a tomb. And so you can see the chariot driver, the noble here. It's actual observation, and you can see his horses, his loyal horses, right with them, and you can see that sort of outline of where it was. Now notice, you know, sort of the shape and structure of that chariot, right? It looks rather like the one we saw for the Harappans. And um, as far as we know, the Shan, the Shan in particular did a lot of fighting on chariots, too, and what they would have is you'd have a driver, and then you'd have two guys with these long pole axes that would stand behind a sort of raised area and then chop down on uh, people as they went by. And they, they seem to have practiced some form of kind of ritualized elite warfare. And you know, idealized. Um, and so in ancient China, up through the Western Zhou, warfare seems to have been the province of the elite. If, if you were of the noble class, you practiced military arts, you did the fighting. In the next lecture, we will talk about sort of the transition away from that to the creation of mass armies where ordinary people fought, as inspired by you know, the writings of the Sunza, the art of war, and things like that. But in the Shan, it seemed to have been reserved primarily for the elites. And as we've seen, if you were captured, if you were a war captive, a POW, very bad things could happen to you. And there were regular campaigns that sort of subdue the unruly uh, people around the Shan. A few things about Chinese writing, a couple things I've already talked about, um, so I'm not going to spend any time on that really. But originally, Chinese writing seems to have been primarily pictographs, and people often think of Chinese writing today as being pictures. But um, so originally pictographic, now it's also phonetic and more abstract. And so there are different elements, and people often think, well, there are so many Chinese characters, how do you memorize them? And it's difficult. But at, in fact, in many cases, what Chinese, the, the way Chinese characters work is that they build on each other. And so each character has a sort of element that denotes its meaning called a radical that sort of classifies it, and then a phonetic element, which is basically how you pronounce it. So in many cases, you can kind of figure out what it means by understanding how that works. And there are essentially 214 radicals, which are the classifiers. And then those are combined to make the Chinese words. And it's still more than the 26 letters of the English alphabet. But it's not quite as daunting as, as you might think. But believe me, it's difficult. <laughs> and on top of that, the, the spoken language is tonal. And so uh, the tone at which you say something determines the meaning. And so it can be, you can say something wrong. You, you can be misinterpreted very easily and say things, you know, you're trying to be polite and greet somebody and you've just insulted their mother or their ancestor or something. 
And so believe me, I've been in situations where I said things that were completely wrong. In fact, that I, I won't use the dirty ones. But, um, but I was talking about purple flowers once, and somebody said, why are you talking about selfish flowers? Because the word for purple and the word for selfish rhyme, but are pronounced in different tones. And like, where are the selfish flowers you're talking about? And um, but there are other you know, very embarrassing ones that, you could, that I can reveal to you, but I won't do it on video. Um, <laughs> however, I'm going to show you a couple of examples of Chinese writing just to show you how it works. You're not going to be asked to reproduce this. But uh, just to give you a sense of, of what I'm talking about here, quickly, so um, some cases they're concepts, right? So you have the Chinese character for tr for tree, which is pronounced mu, and I should, well, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but there's a, there's a stroke order that you write Chinese in, so it's left, right, top down, inside, outside. And it always goes like this. So that's mu. And then if you have two trees together, you have a forest, lin, or three trees. That could be a grove or a forest. So see, it's a simple concept. Now, maybe I'll, and, and so that one's, that one's relatively simple. Maybe it doesn't look like a, uh, a person to you, or a tree to you, rather, but you know, it's branches and stuff. If you put a little... Don't, don't write on the screen. No, I'm not. I'm, just, <laughs> I know, I'm not going to write. It's just a little branch that becomes a root. Done. Root. So now, can, I, can you see, or should I put this up? I'd put it up and change the lighting. All right. So hang on a minute. So what do we do? Do uh, room all? Yep. Let's see if that works. All right. Excuse me. I'm going off screen. And then if you could hit the light to one. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Ah, and there's light. So where is the best place to go? Towards the top, you said? Yep. And anywhere there in the middle, anywhere behind where the screen sits is great. Like over here somewhere? Yep. Okay, great. So, um, so as I mentioned, there are, sometimes they're conceptual, sometimes they're um, pictographic. So to give you an example of a concept, I'll teach you two very, very useful words. Okay, this one, you can see that. That word on the, down at the top means field. The one at the bottom means strength. You put them together, it means non, which means man. Strength in the field. It's man. This one, which is sort of a picture, new. That means woman, because it's the crossed legs of a proper lady. Very important, because that's the ladies' room, that's the men's room. So if you're, if you're ever in China, Japan, or Korea, these words can you know, help you out in a tough situation. But uh, so you know, those are sort of the conceptual ones. Give you a couple other ones. I mentioned the tonal nature of Chinese. So this, this word here. Ma, it means horse in Chinese. Ma, like a, like a you know, galloping horse. So, if you put two little boxes over it, it is pronounced ma. It means to curse someone. Ma, to curse someone. And so I think it comes from yelling at your horse to make it run. That's why the term is, is curse. If you just put Get rid of this and put a woman in front of it. This one that's ma, mother, mama, mama, mother. And um, if you put a mouth in front of your horse instead of on top of your horse, it's ma, it's a question. Ni hao ma, how are you? Flat tone. And so, but see, that, that horse there determines the pronunciation of all the words, just the tone is different. So it'd be ma, ma, ma. Ma. See, very simple, and that's why you can often unintentionally insult someone, especially if you have ten ears like me. <laughs> but, uh, but that just gives you a little sense of the character. What's also very interesting about Chinese, it seems to have been the case since the ancient period, is that no matter what dialect you speak, the writing is the same, and they unify the writing system in the Qin Dynasty, which we'll talk about more later. And so people from different parts of the country, even if they can't understand what each other are saying, they can read, if they can read, they can communicate. And that remains true today. So Japanese and Korean, they pronounce things differently, but if they read Chinese, which at least Japanese often do, they can communicate just by writing. And very useful skill. In fact, I've used it in both Korea and Japan when I was having trouble being understood. I just get out a napkin or something, start writing in Chinese, and like, oh, okay, I know what you say now. A very, very interesting writing system, the way that works. But very crucial to Chinese identity. And I just talked about the ancient, origins of modern China, 
in the monarch era, when the communists took over, there was a movement to actually get rid of the writing and just go with the Western alphabet. And finally, it was decided that this is too essential to Chinese culture to get rid of. So they came up with a simplified way of writing the characters, which is what most Chinese learn today, as opposed to the traditional way, which I actually learned when I was in school. But, um, but they would not get, get rid of the Chinese writing entirely because they said, this is our identity. This is part of who we are. So it's a very interesting connection to the past. But all right, we are going to finish up here. I'm almost done. This is going a little long. But I got to go to two, right? Yep. We got about five minutes. Okay. We're we're at an hour ten. Okay, perfect. This is a beautiful thing about doing this on video. We can actually chat. Yeah. Of course, they'll hear it, but <laughs> makes it more. We are actual human beings doing this. We're not just out in cyberspace somewhere. So we're just getting our computer back up here. It just takes a second to heat up again. We need intermission music. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, this is this is one of the aforementioned Shan ritual vessels, the, the ding, just so you get a sense of this. And a, a lot of them actually have writing on them that sort of explain a ceremony being performed, or in some cases, if it was if it was cast in commemoration of a military victory or something like that, you have that on the vessel itself. And so um, I'm going to actually, in my next lecture, I'm going to talk more about the Joe. I'm just going to briefly say a few things about the uh, transition here, because there's this important concept which you'll read about in your document reader called the Mandate of Heaven, and uh, Chinese uh, Tianming. And so in Chinese history, this is considered the first official dynastic transition. And the idea is that heaven, which is not the same as God in a Western sense, but heaven is this kind of moral force of the universe that governs you know, good and evil. And when a ruler becomes particularly evil, it, heaven will show its disfavor by revoking the mandate, its sanction for that ruler. And so that ruler will then be overthrown by you know, rebel groups, peasant rebels, whoever. And the disfavor can be shown by natural disasters, calamities, you know, earthquakes, locust plagues, droughts, famine, pestilence, whatever you want. And, um, and, then a new, and then a new group has to attain heaven's mandate, heaven's favor, and then be imbued with the power to defeat the, the evil enemies. And what's interesting is that what the Zhou dynasty does, the Zhou were vassals of the Shang, as your textbook talks about. And so they come up with this concept to justify their overthrow of the Shang. And what's great about it is they, they tell very detailed and depraved stories about the last ruler of the Shang dynasty. And um, just to give you a few stories that my old graduate advisor told me in college or told us in class, they said supposedly the last ruler of the Shang dynasty was very depraved. He liked having orgies all the time in his palace. And in fact, he had an entire forest of barbecued meat, the barbecued forest. And then he would chase beautiful naked women around the barbecue forest for his pleasure. And when they were done running around the forest, they would jump into his wine jacuzzi in the palace. And so play in the wine jacuzzi while eating barbecued meat while the, while the people were you know, starving and you know, out in the countryside. And then supposedly he was told of a very righteous man who had a good heart. And so he had the man brought before him. And he said, they said, this man has the best heart in the empire. He goes, truly. They said, yes. He says, okay, cut open his chest. Show me his heart. And they did this, and he said, well, that looks just like anybody else's heart. I don't see anything different. And so as a result of this wickedness and debauchery, the, the last Shang ruler was overthrown by the righteous Joe, who were supposedly desperately outnumbered, yet managed to somehow prevail because they had the mandate of heaven. And they were able to restore order and bring peace to the empire. Subsequent historical inquiry has suggested that, in fact, the Shang were coming back from one of their many military expeditions, and they were treacherously ambushed by the Zhou and by their allies, the Qiang people, who had 
previously been conquered by the Shan, and that it had nothing to do with the wickedness of the king, but rather the opportunity presented itself, and the Zhou took over. But, uh, but it's interesting because from then on, throughout Chinese history, every dynasty, every new conqueror, will come up with stories for why they had to overthrow the previous dynasty. And this becomes a recurrent theme throughout Chinese history. And so this notion of the mandate of heaven is very important because it also gives, in a situation where the people don't really have political rights, it gives them some sort of empowerment because you do, in fact, it's your job to overthrow the wicked according to this justification. So it's a very interesting concept. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Joe in, in the follow-up lecture, so I will leave that for now. Um, so just a few things to consider as we wrap up here are um, the legacies of the ancient civilizations, the writing systems, thought, religion, political organizations, art and architecture, sort of styles of architecture and structures, um, you know, the, uh, the material culture of these civilizations. Uh, the technological innovations, particularly in terms of, the, say, the uh, drainage and sewer systems of the Harappans, the bronze technology of the Shan, the chariots in both cases, the military technology of both places, and sort of how these then spurred later developments uh, for these respective cultures. So a couple of things just to think about in a broad sense. And you, you certainly encounter these in your other civilizations, and so you want to think about these things as, as they go from society to society. And then um, finally, I always like to finish with a few questions for you guys, which you know, consider, right? You know, how are India and China like Egypt and Samaria? You know, what sorts of things do they bring to these cultures that Western civilization got from these other places? You know, how are they different? You know, what were some of the reasons for the success and the endurance of these places, right? Because a lot of the places we study, especially in the ancient period, right, they're gone. That China and India are still here as viable political entities and, and, and connected cultures. Another thing to think about as we move through the class is why was the Indus civilization, you know, and, and less successful in some ways than the civilization that emerged in the Yellow River Valley in China? Was it geographic? Was it cultural? What were some of the reasons that that might have happened? And so, well, thank you for your attention, and I will see you next time.